Welcome to the second in a series of three videos on cultural evolution. Today I'm going to be talking about the transmission of traditional culture and in particular I'm going to look at the transmission of weaving cultures in the islands of East Nusa Tenggara in Indonesia. The sarong I've got on the wall next to me is a ceremonial piece um, from the village of Lamalera on the island of Lembata. It was designed never to be worn, and in fact the sarong is, is unfinished at the back. The warp is taken off the loom uncut, and it's never completed, and you have this unwoven portion running up the back of the sarong. And yet, um, sarongs like this are extremely important items um, for the people of Lamalera, and they play a critical role in the transmission of culture. And today I'm going to explain, amongst other things, why that is. The area we are focusing on is East Nusa Tenggara, a chain of islands in Indonesia that include Flores, Lembata, Alor, Pantar and Timor. These are mostly village-based societies living along coastlines and getting by on a mix of farming and fishing. Many villages still weave traditional textiles for their own use and sometimes for sale to neighbouring villages, such as markets like this one on Lembata. There are common elements to all these weaving traditions, and also aspects that are unique to each dialect group. This makes this region a nice laboratory for the transmission and evolution of culture. I'm going to talk about the results from interviews with 26 weavers, mainly on the islands of Lombata, Alor and Pantar, that I conducted a few years ago. These were open-ended discussions in which I asked weavers to tell me about their experiences learning to weave, how they learned, and about the various activities involved. Weaving tends to be done publicly in East Nusa Tenggara, and it's a social activity, which makes it an ideal topic for a researcher. So how does the younger generation learn weaving in this region? In most cases, daughters learn from their mothers, though some weavers also mentioned grandmothers and aunts. The relationship is a kind of apprenticeship, it's a deferential relationship between the master weaver and the learner, which extends beyond the practical aspects of learning to weave. This relationship can last a lifetime, even after the learner has become an expert herself. There isn't any teaching in the sense that we would usually understand it, so there are no lessons, no activities that are specifically for teaching purposes. Instead, apprentices learn by observing and by doing. The foundation of this relationship is an unspoken agreement that the apprentice will follow the master's methods precisely and will also help with routine tasks like preparing yarn. In return, she's allowed to watch and to learn. In essence, this is a kind of contract between the generations. Weaving is a social activity, as I mentioned. This means that the novice weaver also gets to see what other experienced weavers in the village are doing and to learn about the different techniques, designs and colours that are being used. So weaving is also a kind of extended conversation between generations. As I mentioned in the first video, this conversation has been taking place in Asia in various places and various forms for at least six or seven thousand years. Many of the activities have ritual aspects. Complex activities such as warping the loom are carried out in a predetermined order, even if the order has no obvious connection with the outcome of the work. Some activities can only be done on certain auspicious days, and there are prohibitions that must be observed. In southern China, for example, in most villages, there must be no cloth on the loom at Lunar New Year. Novice weavers are expected to follow these practices exactly and without questioning them. The main products of these weaving activities are sarongs, both for daily use and ceremonial use. Um, but there are other kinds of items woven in this re region, such as this ritual headdress from the island of Timor. It's made using a tapestry technique, and it's a small masterpiece of design and colour. This kind of artefact may be made by one individual weaver, but it's really the product of a lineage of weavers that stretches back over generations. 
The weaving practices I've mentioned are transmitted almost exclusively within the community. They may, may be exchanged between neighbours in the same village, but very rarely outside of it. Another way in which weaving information is exchanged between households within the community is by marriage, which mainly takes place within the group of villages speaking the same dialect. In contrast to this, there are distinct barriers to transmission outside of the community. These are sometimes called transmission isolating mechanisms. The main barriers are those that exist to marrying outside the community. Despite many changes that have taken place in the last few decades, there's still an assumption that you will find a marriage partner close to home. Of the 26 weavers I talked to, all of them were born within their dialect community, and only one had taken a husband from outside her community. Some of the barriers to marriage outside the community relate to textiles. In this photo of a family in the Atadei region of Lembata, the weaver I interviewed is showing off a bridewealth cloth that she wove herself in anticipation of her daughter's marriage. This is a cloth similar to the one that I showed at the introduction to this video. It's a sarong that will never be worn and remains unfinished by tradition. The design and motifs on this sarong are unique to this particular community. The cloth, as it comes off the loom, is tubular and has a small unwoven section. This would normally be cut and out before the ends are then sewn together. But in a Bridewell sarong, the warp is not cut and the unwoven section is left as is. These sarongs are exchanged between families prior to an agreed marriage taking place. Bridewell cloths are passed in one direction, from the bride's family to the groom's family, while other precious objects such as these elephant ivory bangles are passed in the opposite direction. These heirloom objects pass between families in a long slow dance that takes generations. One result of this is that it's extremely difficult for an outsider to penetrate these traditions and to marry into a family on Mbata. This means that cultural knowledge is passed vertically between generations within the community, but very rarely travels horizontally outside of it. Most of the villages on Lambata and on the nearby islands have their own versions of these bride wealth goods. In the neighbouring region of Ili Api, for example, the bride wealth gift is a pair of sarongs. At this point, I'm going to digress a little bit and talk about a topic that I think is relevant to traditional cultures, but is rarely mentioned. This is the importance of information that's embodied in physical objects. We tend to think first about skills and knowledge when we think about cultural transmission. But during my research, I found that there are other forms of information that are also important that must be transmitted and preserved. As well as skills and knowledge, weavers also make use of information in the form of tools, templates, and domesticated plants and animals. Now in East Nusa Tengara, the, the loom is a fairly simple device, and it's one that weavers could probably recreate from memory. But in other parts of Asia, this is not the case. This loom is used by Yao weavers in southern China, for example, and it's an extremely complicated device. Weavers cannot recreate these looms from memory. To make a new one, they need to employ a carpenter, and they need an old loom to copy. So the loom itself is a repository of information. Another important physical format is the template. Simple patterns and designs are sometimes committed to memory, but weavers use templates as well. These may be older heirloom textiles, or they may be purpose-made templates. This weaver in southern China is using an embroidered template, that's the black and white textile, as a guide for the pattern she's adding to the cloth. The final type of embodied information that I want to mention consists of domesticated plants and animals. Now the idea that these can embody information might seem strange, but domesticated plants like this cotton plant are very different from their wild forebears. They are the result of conscious or unconscious selection over generations. 
if this resource is lost, it's not easily replaced. The characteristics of traditional cultural transmission that I've mentioned are not exclusive to Southeast Asian weaving traditions. There's an extensive literature on cultural transmission in traditional societies, and most of it shows the same basic patterns. So we have slow transmission with a great deal of repetition, over-specification with a certain amount of redund redundant or seemingly irrelevant content, and ritual aspects. And to this list, I'd personally add the importance of tools and templates, as I've mentioned. I'm not going to review all this literature here, but I want to mention an interesting book I read recently on traditional Japanese boat building by Douglas Brooks. This guy is a carpenter who apprenticed himself to an amazing total of six different boat builders around Japan, as well as interviewing many more. The stories of his apprenticeships make fascinating reading, and he uncovered many of the same patterns of transmission that I found. Boat builders learn by observing and by doing, with a great deal of repetition, and with absolute deference to the master. The main difference that Douglas observed versus the traditions that I've been looking at is that many boat building apprentices, apprentices are not biologically related to the master. In this situation, there's a degree of conflict of interest between the master and the apprentice. The apprentice wants to learn the trade as fast as possible and to become independent. The master wants to retain the apprentice's services for as long as possible and doesn't want a rival boat builder in his neighborhood. As a consequence, Japanese masters routinely withhold vital details from their apprentices, such as critical details of the proportions of the boats that they're building, and apprentices must try to steal this information from them if they're to learn. We might imagine that generations are engaged in a cooperative task during the transmission of cultural knowledge, but Douglas Brooks's experiences are telling us this is not necessarily the case. And I'm going to conclude this video with a little digression into the theory of transmission based on work done by engineers half a century ago. Claude Shannon and his colleagues analysed a classic problem, how to transmit information accurately between a sender and a receiver over a noisy channel. This might sound remote from cultural transmission, but if I substitute master and apprentice in this diagram, I hope you can see the relevance. A village in East Nusa Tenggara is certainly a noisy channel, with dogs, chickens, children and researchers wandering in and out of the frame. What Shannon and his colleagues discovered is that information can be transmitted accurately under these circumstances by using a few standard tricks. These are repetition, over-specification, and the use of check codes by both sender and receiver. I think the relevance of the first two of these should be obvious. Repetition is standard in the transmission of traditional culture, and many activities are over-specified to some degree. The mention of check codes is interesting, and I think it may have some connection with the presence in ritual in a great many traditions. Ritual is a complex area, and there are a number of possible reasons why it occurs, ranging from social cohesion benefits to evolutionary hitchhiking effects. The aspects of ritual that I want to highlight here are its precise specification and its public nature. And I wonder if one of the purposes of some rituals is to signal to the entire community that the novice is keeping her end of the bargain and learning the tradition correctly. Many steps in weaving are not obvious to the community, but the ritual aspects often are. In particular, the observance of a ritual tells you something about the attitude of the novice learner. There may also be another practical aspect to some of the over-specification that we see in traditional knowledge. Imagine you have a process that consists of a series of steps and you want to check that your novice is doing the job correctly. Perhaps the order doesn't really matter from an efficacy point of view, but if you don't specify the order of the steps precisely, you present the novice with a lot of different alternatives. If the work then doesn't come out as expected, it becomes difficult to troubleshoot the process and to figure out where the mistake is. One solution to this problem is to over-specify the task, making it easier to spot where the novice is going wrong. 
If you tack a ritual step on the front, you also have an indication that the novice is at least starting off in the right frame of mind. That's all for this video. In the final video in this series, I'm going to look at the consequences of these transmission processes, and I will look at how technology evolves in traditional cultures.